Chapter 20 of The Flying Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Thomas Copeland. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 20. The Turk and the Futurists. Mr. Adrian Crook was a successful chemist whose shop was in the neighborhood of Victoria, but his face expressed more than is generally required in a successful chemist. It was a curious face, prematurely old and like parchment, but acute and decisive, with real headwork in every line of it. Nor was his conversation, when he did converse, out of keeping with this. He had lived in many countries, and had a rich store of anecdote about the more quaint and sometimes the more sinister side of his work. Visions of the vapour of eastern drugs, or guesses at the ingredients of Renaissance poisons. He himself, it need hardly be said, was a most respectable and reliable apothecary, or he would not have had the custom of families, especially among the upper classes. But he enjoyed as a hobby the study of the dark days and lands where his science had lain sometimes on the borders of magic, and sometimes upon the borders of murder. Hence it often happened that persons who in their serious senses were well aware of his harmless and useful habits would leave his shop on some murky and foggy night with their heads so full of wild tales of the eating of hemp or the poisoning of roses that they could hardly help fancying that the shop, with its glowing moon of crimson or saffron, like bowls of blood and sulphur, was really a house of the black art. It was doubtless for such conversational pleasures, in part, that Hibbs, however, entered the shop, as well as for a small glass of the same restorative medicine which he had been taking when Levison found him by the open window. But this did not prevent Hibbs from expressing considerable surprise and some embarrassment when Levison entered the same chemist's and asked for the same chemical. Indeed, Levison looked harassed and weary enough to want it, "'You've been out of town, haven't you?' said Levison. "'No luck. They got away again on some quibble. The police wouldn't make the arrest, and even old Meadows thought it might be illegal. I'm sick of it. Where are you going?' "'I thought,' said Mr. Hibbs, "'of dropping in at this post-futurist exhibition. I believe Lord Ivywood will be there. He is showing it to the Prophet. I don't pretend to know much about art, but I hear it's very fine.' There was a long silence, and Mr. Levison said, People always prejudiced against new ideas. Then there was another long silence, and Mr. Hibbs said, After all, they said the same of Whistler. Refreshed by this ritual, Mr. Levison became conscious of the existence of Crook, and said to him cheerfully, That's so in your department too, isn't it? I suppose the greatest pioneers in chemistry were unpopular in their own time. "'Look at the Borgers,' said Mr. Crook. "'They got themselves quite disliked.' "'You're very flippant, you know,' said Levison, in a fatigued way. "'Well, so long. Are you coming, Hibbs?' And the two gentlemen, who were both attired in high hats and afternoon collars' coats, betook themselves down the street. It was a fine sunny day, the twin of the day before that had shone so brightly on the white town of Peaceways, and their walk was a pleasant one, along a handsome street with high houses and small trees that overlooked the river all the way. For the pictures were exhibited in a small but famous gallery, a rather rococo building of which the entrance steps almost descended upon the Thames. The building was girt on both sides and behind with gaudy flower beds, and on the top of the steps, in front of the Byzantine doorway, stood their old friend Mrs. Ammon, smiling broadly and in an unusually sumptuous costume. But even the sight of that fragrant eastern flower did not seem to revive altogether the spirits of the drooping secretary. "'You have come,' said the beaming prophet, "'to see the decoration. It is approved. I have approved it.' "'We came to see the post-futurist pictures,' began Hibbs, but Levison was silent." "'There are no pictures,' said the Turk, simply. "'If there had been, I could not have approved. "'For those of our religion, pictures are not good. "'They are idols, my friends. "'Look in there, 
and he turned and darted a solemn forefinger just under his nose toward the gates of the gallery. Look in there, and you will find no idols, no idols at all. I have most carefully looked into every one of the frames, every one I have approved. No trace of the man form, no trace of the animal form. All decoration as good as the goodest of carpets. It harms not. Lord Ivywood, smile of happiness, for I tell him Islam indeed progresses. The old Moslems allow to draw the picture of the vegetable. Here I hunt even for the vegetable, and there is no vegetable. Hibbs, whose trade was tact, naturally did not think it wise that the eminent Missisra should go on lecturing from a tall flight of steps to the whole street and river, so he had slipped past with a general proposal to go in and see. The prophet and the secretary followed, and all entered the outer hall where Lord Ivywood stood with the white face of a statue. He was the only statue the new Moslems were allowed to worship. On a sofa, like a purple island in the middle of the sea of floor, sat Enid Wimpole, talking eagerly to her cousin Dorian, doing, in fact, her best to prevent the family quarrel, which threatened to follow hard on the incident at Westminster. In the deeper perspective of the rooms, Lady Joan Brett was floating about, and if her attitude before the post-futurist pictures could not be called humble or even inquiring, it is but just to that school to say that she seemed to be quite as bored with the floor that she walked on and the parasol she held. Bit by bit other figures or groups of that world drifted through the exhibition of the post-futurists. It is a very small world, but it is just big enough and just small enough to govern a country, that is, a country with no religion, and it has all the vanity of a mob and all the reticence of a secret society. Levison instantly went up to Lord Ivywood, pulled papers from his pocket, and was plainly telling him of the escape from Peaceways. Ivywood's face hardly changed. He was, or felt, above some things, and one of them was blaming a servant before the servant's social superiors. But no one could say he looked less like cold marble than before. I made all possible inquiries about their subsequent route, the secretary was heard saying, and the most serious feature is that they seem to have taken the road for London. Quite so, replied the statue. They will be easier to capture here. Lady Enid, by a series of assurances, most of which were, I regret to say, lies, had succeeded in preventing the scandal of her cousin Dorian actually cutting her cousin Philip. But she knew very little of the masculine temper if she really thought she had prevented the profound intellectual revolt of the poet against the politician. Ever since he heard Mr. Hibbs say, Yars, yars, and order his arrest by a common policeman, the feelings of Dorian Wimpole had flowed for some four days and nights in a direction highly contrary to the ideals of Mr. Hibbs, and the sudden reappearance of that blameless diplomatist quickened the mental current to a cataract. But as he could not insult Hibbs, whom socially he did not even know, and could not insult Ivywood, with whom he had just had a formal reconciliation, it was absolutely necessary that he should insult something else instead. All watchers for the dawn will be deeply distressed to know that the post-futurist school of painting received the full effects of this perverted wrath. In vain did Mr. Levison affirm, from time to time, people always prejudiced against new ideas. Vainly did Mr. Hibbs say at the proper intervals, after all, they said the same of Whistler. Not by such decent formalities was the frenzy of Dorian to be appeased. That little Turk has more sense than you have, he said. He passes it as a good wallpaper. I should say it was a bad wallpaper the sort of wallpaper that gives a sick man fever when he hasn't got it. But to call it pictures, you might as well call it seats at the Lord Mayor's show. A seat isn't a seat if you can't see the Lord Mayor's show. A picture isn't a picture if you can't see any picture. You can sit down at home more comfortably than you can at a procession, and you can walk about at home more comfortably than you can at a picture gallery. There's only one thing to be said for a street show or a picture show, and that is whether there is anything to be shown. Now then, show me something. 
Well, said Lord Ivywood, good-humouredly, motioning toward the wall in front of him, let me show you the portrait of an old lady. Well, said Dorian stolidly, which is it? Mr. Hibbs made a hasty gesture of identification, but was so unfortunate as to point to the picture of rain in the Apennines instead of the portrait of an old lady, and his intervention increased the irritation of Dorian Wimpole. Most probably, as Mr. Hibbs afterward explained, it was because a vivacious movement of the elbow of Mr. Wimpole interfered with the exact pointing of the forefinger of Mr. Hibbs. In any case, Mr. Hibbs was sharply and horridly fixed by embarrassment, so that he had to go away to the refreshment bar and eat three lobster patties, and even drink a glass of that champagne that had once been his ruin. But on this occasion he stopped at one glass, and returned with the full diplomatic responsibility. He returned to find that Dorian Wimpole had forgotten all the facts of time, place, and personal pride in an argument with Lord Ivywood, exactly as he had forgotten such facts in an argument with Patrick Dalroy in a dark wood with a donkey cart. And Philip Ivywood was interested also. His cold eyes even shone, for, though his pleasure was almost purely intellectual, it was utterly sincere. "'And I do trust the untried. I do follow the inexperienced,' he was saying, quietly, with his fine inflections of voice. "'You say this is changing the very nature of art. I want to change the very nature of art. Everything lives by turning into something else. Exaggeration is growth.' "'But exaggeration of what?' demanded Dorian. "'I cannot see a trace of exaggeration in these pictures, "'because I cannot find a hint of what it is they want to exaggerate. "'You can't exaggerate the feathers of a cow or the legs of a whale. "'You can draw a cow with feathers or a whale with legs for a joke, "'though I hardly think such jokes are in your line. "'But don't you see, my good Philip, "'that even then the joke depends on its looking like a cow "'and not only like a thing with feathers.' Even then the joke depends on the whale as well as the legs. You can combine up to a certain point, you can distort up to a certain point. After that you lose the identity, and with that you lose everything. A centaur is so much of a man with so much of a horse. The centaur must not be hastily identified with the horsey man, and the mermaid must be maidenly, even if there is something fishy about her social conduct. No, said Lord Ivywood, in the same quiet way. I understand what you mean, and I don't agree. I should like the centaur to turn into something else that is neither man nor horse. But not something that has nothing of either? asked the poet. Yes, answered Ivywood, with the same queer, quiet gleam in his colourless eyes. Something that has nothing of either. But what's the good? argued Dorian. A thing that is changed entirely has not changed at all. It has no bridge of crisis. It can remember no change. If you wake up tomorrow and you simply are Mrs. Dope, an old woman who lets lodgings at Broadstairs, well, I don't doubt Mrs. Dope is a saner and happier person than you are. But in what way have you progressed? What part of you is better? Don't you see this prime fact of identity is the limit set on all living things? No, said Philip, with suppressed but sudden violence. I deny that any limit is set upon living things. Why, then, I understand, said Dorian, why, though you make such good speeches, you have never written any poetry. Lady Joan, who was looking with tedium at a rich pattern of purple and green in which Missistra attempted to interest her, imploring her to disregard the mere title, which idolatrously stated it as First Communion in the Snow, abruptly turned her full face to Dorian. It was a face to which few men could feel indifferent, especially when thus suddenly shown them. Why can't he write poetry? she asked. Do you mean he would resent the limits of meter and rhyme and so on? The poet reflected for a moment and then said, Well, partly, but I mean more than that, too. As one can be candid in the family, I may say that what everyone says about him is that he has no humor. But that's not my complaint at all. I think my complaint is that he has no pathos. 
that is, he does not feel human limitations, that is, he will not write poetry. Lord Ivywood was looking with his cold, unconscious profile into a little black-and-yellow picture called Enthusiasm, but Joan Brett leaned across to him with swarthy eagerness and cried quite provocatively, Dorian says you have no pathos. Have you any pathos? He says it's the sense of human limitations. Ivywood did not remove his gaze from the picture of Enthusiasm, but simply said, No, I have no sense of human limitations. Then he put up his elderly eyeglass to examine the picture better. Then he dropped it again and confronted Joan with a face paler than usual. Joan, he said, I would walk where no man has walked and find something beyond tears and laughter. My road shall be my road indeed, for I will make it like the Romans. And my adventures shall not be in the hedges and the gutters, but in the borders of the ever-advancing brain. I will think what was unthinkable until I thought it. I will love what never lived until I loved it. I will be as lonely as the first man. They say, she said after a silence, that the first man fell. You mean the priests, he answered. Yes, but even they admit that he discovered good and evil. So are these artists trying to discover some distinction that is still dark to us? Oh, said Joan, looking at him with real and unusual interest. Then you don't see anything in the pictures yourself? I see the breaking of barriers, he answered. Beyond that I see nothing. She looked at the floor for a little time and traced patterns with her parasol, like one who has really received food for thought. Then she said, suddenly, but perhaps the breaking of barriers might be the breaking of everything. The clear and colourless eyes looked at her quite steadily. Perhaps, said Lord Ivywood. Dorian Wimpole made a sudden movement a few yards off, where he was looking at a picture, and said, Hello, what's this? Mr. Hibbs was literally gaping in the direction of the entrance. Framed in that fine Byzantine archway stood a great big bony man in threadbare but careful clothes, with a harsh, high-featured, intelligent face, to which a dark beard under the chin gave something of the puritanic cast. Somehow his whole personality seemed to be pulled together and explained when he spoke with a North Country accent. "'We lads,' he said genially, "'toos may be great on pictures, but I come for southern in a moog. Ha-ha!' Levison and Hibbs looked at each other. Then Levison rushed from the room. Lord Ivywood did not move a finger, but Mr. Wimpole, with a sort of poetic curiosity, drew nearer to the stranger and studied him. "'It's perfectly awful,' cried Enid Wimpole in a loud whisper. "'The men must be drunk.' "'No, nah, lass,' said the man, with gallantry. "'I've not been drunk, nor but at Hurley Fair these years and all. I'm a decent lad, and working my way back dwarf side. No harm in a moog of ale, lass. Are you quite sure? asked Dorian Wimpole, with a singular sort of delicate curiosity. Are you quite sure you're not drunk? I'm not drunk, said the man jovially. Even if these were licensed premises, began Dorian, in the same diplomatic manner. There's sign on twos, said the stranger. The black, bewildered look on the face of Joan Brett suddenly altered. She took four steps toward the doorway, and then went back and sat on the purple ottoman. But Dorian seemed fascinated with his inquiry into the alleged decency of the lad who was working his way to Wharfdale. Even if these were licensed premises, he repeated, drink could be refused you if you were drunk. Now, are you really sure you're not drunk? Would you know if it was raining, say? I, said the man with conviction, would you know any common object of your countryside, inquired Dorian scientifically, a woman, let us say an old woman. I, said the man with good humour. What on earth are you doing with the creature? whispered Enid feverishly. I am trying, answered the poet, to prevent a very sensible man from smashing a very silly shop. I beg your pardon, sir. As I was saying, would you know these things in a picture now? Do you know what a landscape is and what a portrait is? Forgive my asking. You see, we are responsible while we keep the place going. 
there soared up into the sky like a cloud of rooks the eager vanity of the north. We call your lads a none so badly educated lad, he said. In the town I was born in, there was a gallery of pictures as fine as London. I and un knew em too. Thank you, said Wimpole, pointing suddenly at the wall. Would you be so kind, for instance, as to look at these two pictures? One represents an old woman, and the other rain in the hills. It's a mere formality. You shall have your drink when you've said which is which. The northerner bowed his huge body before the two frames and peered into them patiently. The long stillness that followed seemed to be something of a strain on Joan, who rose in a restless manner, first went to look out of a window, and then went out of the front door. At length the art critic lifted a large, puzzled, but still philosophical face. Somehow, rather, he said, a man be drunk after all. You have testified, cried Dorian with animation. You have all but saved civilization, and by God you shall have your drink. And he brought from the refreshment table a huge bumper of the Hibsian champagne, and declined payment by the rapid method of running out of the gallery onto the steps outside. Joan was already standing there. Out the little side window she had seen the incredible thing she expected to see, which explained the ludicrous scene inside. She saw the red and blue wooden flag of Mr. Pump standing up in the flower-beds in the sun, as serenely as if it were a tall and tropical flower. And yet, in the brief interval between the window and the door, it had vanished, as if to remind her it was a flying dream but two men were in a little motor outside which was in the very act of starting. They were in motoring disguise, but she knew who they were. All that was deep in her, all that was sceptical, all that was stoical, all that was noble, made her stand as still as one of the pillars of the porch. But a dog, bearing the name of Quoodle, sprang up in the moving car and barked with joy at the mere sight of her, and though she had borne all else, Something in that bestial innocence of an animal suddenly blinded her with tears. It could not, however, blind her to the extraordinary fact that followed. Mr. Dorian Wimpole, attired in anything but motoring costume, dressed in that compromise between fashion and art, which seems proper to the visiting of picture galleries, did not by any means stand as still as one of the pillars of the porch. He rushed down the steps, ran after the car, and actually sprang into it, without disarranging his Whistlerian silk hat. "'Good afternoon,' he said to Dalroy, pleasantly. "'You owe me a motor-ride, you know.'" End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of The Flying Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Thomas Copeland. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 21. The Road to Roundabout. Patrick Dalroy looked at the invader with a heavy and yet humorous expression, and merely said, I didn't steal your car, really, I didn't. Oh, no, answered Dorian. I've heard all about it since. And as you're rather the persecuted party, so to speak, it wouldn't be fair not to tell you that I don't agree much with Ivywood about all this. I disagree with him. Or rather, to speak medically, he disagrees with me. He has, ever since I woke up after an oyster supper and found myself in the House of Commons with policemen calling out, Who goes home? Indeed, inquired Dalroy, drawing his red bushy eyebrows together. Do the officials in Parliament say, Who goes home? Yes, answered Wimpole, indifferently. It's a part of some old custom in the days when members of Parliament might be attacked in the street. Well, inquired Patrick in a rational tone, why aren't they attacked in the street? There was a silence. It is a holy mystery, said the captain at last. But who goes home? That is uncommonly good. The captain had received the poet into the car with all possible expressions of affability and satisfaction, but the poet, who was keen-sighted enough about people of his own sort, could not help thinking that the captain was a little absent-minded. As they flew thundering through the mazes of South London, 
for Pump had crossed Westminster Bridge and was making for the Surrey Hills, the big blue eyes of the big red-haired man rolled perpetually up and down the streets, and, after longer and longer silences, he found expression for his thoughts. "'Doesn't it strike you that there are a very large number of chemists in London nowadays?' "'Are there?' asked Wimpole, carelessly. "'Well, there certainly are two very close to each other just over there.' "'Yes, and both the same name,' replied Dalroy. "'Crook. And I saw the same Mr. Crook chemicalizing round the corner. He seems to be a highly omnipresent deity.' "'A large business, I suppose,' observed Dorian Wimpole. "'Too large for its profits, I should say,' said Dalroy. "'What can people want with two chemists of the same sort within a few yards of each other? "'Do they put one leg into one shop and one into the other, "'and have their corns done in both at once? "'Or do they take an acid in one shop and an alkali in the next "'and wait for the fizz? "'Or do they take the poison in the first shop and the emetic in the second shop? "'It seems like carrying delicacy too far.' It almost amounts to living a double life. But perhaps, said Dorian, he is an uproariously popular chemist, this Mr. Crook. Perhaps there's a rush on some specialty of his. It seems to me, said the captain, that there are certain limitations to such popularity in the case of a chemist. If a man sells very good tobacco, people may smoke more and more of it from sheer self-indulgence. But I never heard of anybody exceeding in cod liver oil. Even castor oil, I should say, is regarded with respect, rather than true affection. After a few minutes of silence, he said, Is it safe to stop here for an instant, Pump? I think so, replied Humphrey, if you'll promise me not to have any adventures in the shop. The motor-car stopped before yet a fourth arsenal of Mr. Crook and his pharmacy, and Dalroy went in. Before Pump and his companion could exchange a word, the captain came out again, with a curious expression on his countenance, especially round the mouth. "'Mr. Wimpole,' said Dalroy, "'will you give us the pleasure of dining with us this evening? Many would consider it an unceremonious invitation to an unconventional meal, and it may be necessary to eat it under a hedge or even up a tree. But you are a man of taste, and one does not apologize for hump's rum or hump's cheese to persons of taste. We will eat and drink of our best tonight. It is a banquet. I am not very certain whether you and I are friends or enemies, but at least there shall be peace tonight. Friends, I hope, said the poet, smiling, but why peace especially tonight? Because there will be war tomorrow, answered Patrick Dalroy, whichever side of it you may be on. I have just made a singular discovery. And he relapsed into his silence as they flew out of the fringe of London into the woods and hills beyond Croydon. Dalroy remained in the same mood of brooding. Dorian was brushed by the butterfly wing of that fleeting slumber that will come on a man hurried through the air after long lounging in hot drawing-rooms. Even the dog Coodle was asleep at the bottom of the car. As for Humphrey Pump, he very seldom talked when he had anything else to do. Thus it happened that long landscapes and perspectives were shot past them like suddenly shifted slides and long stretches of time elapsed before any of them spoke again. The sky was changing from the pale golds and greens of evening to the burning blue of a strong summer night, a night of strong stars. The walls of woodland that flew past them like long assegais were mostly, at first, of the fenced and park-like sort, endless oblong blocks of black pine wood shut in by boxes of thin grey wood. But soon, Fences began to sink, and pine woods to straggle, and roads to split and even to sprawl. Half an hour later, Dalroy had begun to realize something romantic and even faintly reminiscent in the role of the country, and Humphrey Pump had long known he was on the marches of his native land. So far as the difference could be defined by a detail, it seemed to consist not so much in the road rising as in the road perpetually winding. It was more like a path, and even where it was abrupt or aimless, it seemed the more alive. They appeared to be ascending a big, dim hill that was built in a crowd of little hills with rounded tops. It was like a cluster of domes. Among these domes, 
The road climbed and curled in multitudinous curves and angles. It was almost impossible to believe that it could turn itself and round on itself so often without tying itself in a knot and choking. I say, said Dalroy, breaking the silence suddenly, this car will get giddy and fall down. Perhaps, said Dorian, beaming at him, my car, as you may have noticed, was much steadier. Patrick laughed, but not without a shade of confusion. I hope you got back your car all right, he said. This is really nothing for speed, but it's an uncommonly good little climber, and it seems to have some climbing to do just now, and even more wandering. The roads certainly seem to be very irregular, said Dorian, reflectively. Well, cried Patrick, with a queer kind of impatience, you are English and I'm not. You ought to know why the road winds about like this. Why, the saints deliver us, he cried. It's one of the wrongs of Ireland that she can't understand England. England won't understand herself. England won't tell us why these roads go wriggling about. Englishmen won't tell us. You won't tell us. Don't be too sure, said Dorian, with a quiet irony. Dalroy, with an irony far from quiet, emitted a loud yell of victory. Right, he shouted, more songs of the car club. We're all poets here, I hope. Each shall write something about why the road jerks about so much. So much as this, for example, he added, as the whole vehicle nearly rolled over in a ditch. For indeed, Pump appeared to be attacking such inclines as are more suitable for a goat than a small motor car. This may have been exaggerated in the emotions of his companions, who had both, for different reasons, seen much of mere flat country lately. The sensation was like a combination of trying to get into the middle of the maze at Hampton Court and climbing the spiral staircase to the belfry at Bruges. This is the right way to roundabout, said Dalroy cheerfully. Charming place, salubrious spot. You can't miss it. First to the left and right and straight on, round the corner and back again. That'll do for my poem. Get on, you slackers. Why aren't you writing your poems? I'll try one if you like, said Dorian, treating his flattered egotism lightly. But it's too dark to write, and getting darker. Indeed, they had come under a shadow between them and the stars, like the brim of a giant's hat, only through the holes and rents in which the summer stars could now look down on them. The hill like a cluster of domes, though smooth and even bare in its lower contours, was topped with a tangle of spanning trees that sat above them like a bird brooding over its nest. The wood was larger and vaguer than the clump that is the crown of the hill at Chanctonbury, but was rather like it, and held much the same high and romantic position. The next moment they were in the wood itself, and winding in and out among the trees by a ribbon of paths. The emerald twilight between the stems, combined with the dragon-like contortions of the great grey roots of the beeches, had a suggestion of monsters and the deep sea, especially as a long litter of crimson and copper-coloured fungi, which might well have been the more gorgeous types of anemone or jellyfish, reddened the ground like a sunset dropped from the sky. And yet, contradictorily enough, they had also a strong sense of being high up, and even near to heaven, and the brilliant summer stars that stared through the chinks of the leafy roof might almost have been white starry blossoms on the trees of the wood. But though they had entered the wood as if it were a house, their strongest sensation still was the rotatory. It seemed as if that high green house went round and round like a revolving lighthouse, or the whizgig temple in the old pantomimes. The stars seemed to circle over their heads, and Dorian felt almost certain he had seen the same beech tree twice. At length they came to a central place, where the hill rose in a sort of cone in the thick of its trees, lifting its trees with it. Here Pump stopped the car, and clambering up the slope, came to the crawling colossal roots of a very large but very low beech tree. It spread out to the four quarters of heaven, more in the manner of an octopus than a tree, and within its low crown of branches there was a kind of hollow, like a cup, into which Mr. Humphrey Pump of the old ship Pebblewick suddenly and entirely disappeared. When he appeared, it was with a kind of rope ladder, which he politely hung over the side for his companions to ascend by, but the captain preferred to swing himself on to one of the octopine branches, 
with a whirl of large wild legs worthy of a chimpanzee. When they were established there, each propped in the hollow against a branch, almost as comfortably as in an armchair, Humphrey himself descended once more and began to take out their simple stores. The dog was still asleep in the car. "'An old haunt of yours, Hump, I suppose,' said the captain. "'You seem quite at home.' "'I am at home,' answered Pump, with gravity, at the sign of the old ship. And he stuck the old blue and red signboard erect among the toadstools, as if inviting the passer-by to climb the trees for a drink. The tree just topped the mound or clump of trees, and from it they could see the whole champagne of the country they had passed, with the silver roads roaming about in it like rivers. They were so exalted they could almost fancy the stars would burn them. "'Those roads remind me of the songs you've all promised,' said Dalroy at last. "'Let's have some supper, Hump, and then recite.' Humphrey had hung one of the motor lanterns onto a branch above him, and proceeded by the light of it to tap the keg of rum and hand round the cheese. "'What an extraordinary thing!' exclaimed Dorian Wimpole suddenly. "'Why, I'm quite comfortable. Such a thing has never happened before, I should imagine. And how holy this cheese tastes!' "'It has gone on a pilgrimage,' said Dalroy, "'or rather a crusade. It's a heroic a fighting cheese.' "'Cheese of all cheeses, cheeses of all the world, "'as my compatriot, Mr. Yates, says to the something or other of battle. "'It's almost impossible that this cheese can have come out of such a coward as a cow. "'I suppose,' he added wistfully, "'I suppose it wouldn't do to explain that in this case Hump had milked the bull. "'That would be classed by scientists among Irish legends, "'those that have the Celtic glamour and all that. "'No, I think this cheese must have come from that dun cow of Dunsmore Heath, "'who had horns bigger than elephant's tusks, "'and who was so ferocious that one of the greatest of the old heroes of chivalry "'was required to do battle with it. "'The rum's good, too. "'I've earned this glass of rum, earned it by Christian humility. "'For nearly a month I've lowered myself to the beasts of the field "'and gone about on all fours like a teetotaler. Hump. "'Circulate the bottle, I mean the cask, "'and let us have some of this poetry that you're so keen about. "'Each poem must have the same title, you know. "'It's a rattling good title. "'It's called An Inquiry into the Causes, "'Geological, Historical, Agricultural, Psychological, "'Psychical, Moral, Spiritual, and Theological "'of the alleged cases of double, treble, quadruple, "'and other curvature in the English road.' conducted by a specially appointed secret commission in a hole in a tree by admittedly judicious and academic authorities specially appointed by themselves to report to the dog poodle having power to add to their number and also to take away the number they first thought of god save the king having delivered this formula with blinding rapidity he added rather breathlessly that's the note to strike the lyric note for all his rather formless hilarity, Dalroy still impressed the poet as being more distrait than the others, as if his mind were laboring with some bigger thing in the background. He was in a sort of creative trance, and Humphrey Pump, who knew him like his own soul, knew well that it was not merely literary creation. Rather, it was a kind of creation which many modern moralists would call destruction. For Patrick Dalroy was not a little to his misfortune, what is called a man of action. As Captain Dawson realized when he found his entire person a bright pea-green, fond as he was of jokes and rhymes, nothing he could write or even sing ever satisfied him like something he could do. Thus it happened that his contribution to the metrical inquiry into the crooked roads was avowedly hasty and flippant, while Dorian, who was of the opposite temper, the temper that receives impressions instead of pushing out to make them, found his artist's love of beauty fulfilled as it had never been before in that noble nest, and was far more serious and human than usual. Patrick's verses ran, Some say that Guy of Warwick, the man that killed the cow and brake the mighty boar alive beyond the bridge at Slough, went up against a loathly worm that wasted all the downs, and so the roads they twist and squirm, if I may be allowed the term, from the writhing of the stricken worm that died in seven towns. 
I see no scientific proof that this idea is sound, and I should say they wound about to find the town of Roundabout, the merry town of Roundabout, that makes the world go round. Some say that Robin Goodfellow, whose lantern lights the meads, to steal a phrase Sir Walter Scott in heaven no longer needs, such dance around the trysting place the moon struck lover leads, which superstition I should scout. There is more faith in honest doubt, as Tennyson has pointed out, than in those nasty creeds. But peace and righteousness, St. John, in Roundabout can kiss, and since that's all that's found about the pleasant town of Roundabout, the roads they simply bound about to find out where it is. Some say that when Sir Lancelot went forth to find the Grail, Grey Merlin wrinkled up the roads for hope that he should fail. All roads led back to Lioness and Camelot in the Vale. I cannot yield assent to this extravagant hypothesis. The plain, shrewd Briton will dismiss such rumours, Daily Mail. But in the streets around about are no such factions found, or theories to expound about, or roll upon the ground about, in the happy town of Roundabout that makes the world go round. Patrick Dalroy relieved his feelings by finishing with a shout draining a stiff glass of his sailor's wine, turning restlessly on his elbow and looking across the landscape toward London. Dorian Wimpole had been drinking golden rum and strong starlight and the fragrance of forests, and though his verses too were burlesque, he read them more emotionally than was his wont. Before the Roman came to Rye or out of Severn strode, the rolling English drunkard made the rolling English road, a reeling road, a rolling road that rambles round the shire, and after him the parson ran, the sexton and the squire, a merry road, a mazy road, and such as we did tread that night we went to Birmingham by way of Beachy Head. I knew no harm of Bonaparte and plenty of the squire, and for to fight the Frenchman I did not much desire. But I did bash their bagonets, because they came arrayed to straighten out the crooked road an English drunkard made, for you and I went down the lane with ale mugs in our hands the night we went to Glastonbury by way of Goodwin Sands. His sins they were forgiven him, for why do flowers run behind him, and the hedges all strengthening in the sun? The wild thing went from left to right, and knew not which was which. But the wild rose was above him when they found him in the ditch. God pardon us, nor harden us. We did not see so clear the night we went to Bannockburn by way of Brighton Pier. My friends, we will not go again, or ape an ancient rage, or stretch the folly of our youth to be the shame of age, but walk with clearer eyes and ears this path that wandereth, and see undrugged in evening light the decent inn of death. For there is good news yet to hear, and fine things to be seen, before we go to paradise by way of Kensal Green. Have you written one, Hump? asked Delroy. Humphrey, who had been scribbling hard under the lamp, looked up with a dismal face. Yes, he said, but I write under a great disadvantage. You see, I know why the road curves about. And he read very rapidly, all on one note. The road turned first toward the left, where Pinker's quarry made the cleft. The path turned next toward the right, because the mastiff used to bite. Then left, because of slippery height, and then again toward the right. We could not take the left, because it would have been against the laws. Squire closed it in King William's day, because it was a right of way. Still right, to dodge the ridge of chalk where Parson's ghost it used to walk, till someone Parson used to know met him blind drunk in Calio then left a long way round to skirt the good land where old doggy Bert was owner of the crown and cup and would not give his freehold up. Right, missing the old river bed, they tried to make him take instead right, since they say Sir Gregory went mad and let the gypsies be, and so they have their camp secure. And though not honest, they are poor, and that is something. Then along and first to right, no, I am wrong, second to right, of course, the first is what the holy sisters cursed, and none defy their awful oaths since the policeman lost his clothes because of fairies. Right again, what used to be High Toby Lane, left by the double larch, and right until the milestone is in sight, because the road is firm and good from past the milestone to the wood, 
and I was told by Dr. Lowe, whom Mr. Wimple's aunt would know, who lives at Oxford writing books, and ain't so silly as he looks, the Roman did that little bit, and we've done all the rest of it. By which we hardly seemed to score, left and then forward as before, to where they nearly hanged Miss Brown, who told them not to cut her down, but loose the rope or let her swing, because it was a waste of string, left once again by Hunker's Cleft, and right beyond the elm and left, Five fills right by nineteen nicks and left. No, no, no! Hump, hump, hump! cried Dalroy in a sort of terror. Don't be exhaustive. Don't be a scientist, hump, and lay waste fairyland. How long does it go on? Is there a lot more of it? Yes, said Pump in a stony manner. There is a lot more of it. And it's all true? inquired Dorian Wimple with interest. Yes, replied Pump with a smile. It's all true. "'My complaint exactly,' said the captain. "'What you want is legends. "'What you want is lies, "'especially at this time of night, "'and on rum like this, "'and on our first and our last holiday. "'What do you think about rum?' "'he asked Wimpole. "'About this particular rum "'in this particular tree "'at this particular moment,' "'answered Wimpole, "'I think it is the nectar of the younger gods.' If you ask me in a general synthetic sense what I think of rum, well, I think it's rather rum. You find it a trifle sweet, I suppose, said Dalroy, with some bitterness. Sybarite. By the way, he said abruptly, what a silly word that word hedonist is. The really self-indulgent people generally like sour things and not sweet. Bitter things like caviar and curries or what not. It's the saints who like the sweets. At least I have known at least five women who were practically saints, and they all preferred sweet champagne. Look here, Wimpole. Shall I tell you the ancient oral legend about the origin of rum? I told you what you wanted was legends. Be careful to preserve this one and hand it on to your children, for unfortunately my parents carelessly neglected the duty of handing it on to me. After the words, a farmer had three sons, all that I owe to tradition ceases. But when the three boys last met in the village marketplace, they were all sucking sugar sticks. Nevertheless, they were all discontented, and on that day parted for ever. One remained on his father's farm, hungering for his inheritance. One went up to London to seek his fortune, as fortunes are found today in that town forgotten of God. The third ran away to sea, and the first two flung away their sugar sticks in shame, and he on the farm was always drinking smaller and sourer beer for the love of money, and he that was in town was always drinking richer and richer wines that men might see that he was rich. But he who ran away to sea actually ran on board with the sugar stick in his mouth, and St. Peter or St. Andrew or whoever is the patron of men in boats touched it and turned it into a fountain for the comfort of men upon the sea. That is the sailor's theory of the origin of rum. Inquiry addressed to any busy captain with a new crew in the act of shipping an unprecedented cargo will elicit a sympathetic agreement. Your rum, at least, said Dorian, good-humouredly, may well produce a fairy tale, but indeed I think all this would have been a fairy tale without it. Patrick raised himself from his arboreal throne, and leaned against his branch with a curious and sincere sense of being rebuked. "'Yours was a good poem,' he said, with seeming irrelevance, "'and mine was a bad one. "'Mine was bad partly because I'm not a poet, as you are, "'but almost as much because I was trying to make up another song at the same time, "'and it went to another tune, you see.' "'He looked out over the rolling roads and said almost to himself, in the city set upon slime and loam, they cry in their parliament, Who goes home? And there is no answer in arch or dome, for none in the city of graves goes home. Yet these shall perish and understand, for God has pity on this great land. Men that are men again, who goes home? Toxin and trumpeter, who goes home? For there's blood on the field and blood on the foam, and blood on the body when man goes home. And a voice valedictory, who is for victory, who is for liberty, who goes home? Softly and idly, as he had said this second rhyme, there were circumstances about his attitude that must have troubled or interested anyone who did not know him well. 
May I ask, asked Dorian, laughing, why it is necessary to draw your sword at this stage of the affair? Because we have left the place called Roundabout, answered Patrick, and we have come to a place called Rightabout. And he lifted his sword toward London, and the grey glint upon it came from a low grey light in the east. End of chapter 21。Chapter 22 of The Flying Inn。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Thomas Copeland. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 22. The Chemistry of Mr. Crook. When the celebrated Hibbs next visited the shop of Crook, that mystic and criminologist chemist, he found the premises were impressively and even amazingly enlarged with decorations in the Eastern style. Indeed, it would not have been too much to say that Mr. Crook's shop occupied the whole of one side of a showy street in the West End, the other side being a blank façade of public buildings. It would be no exaggeration to say that Mr. Crook was the only shopkeeper for some distance round. Mr. Crook still served in his shop, however, and politely hastened to serve his customer with the medicine that was customary. Unfortunately, for some reason or other, history was in connection with this shop only too prone to repeat itself, and after a vague but soothing conversation with a chemist on the subject of vitriol and its effects on human happiness, Mr. Hibbs experienced the acute annoyance of once more beholding his most intimate friend, Mr. Joseph Levison, enter the same fashionable emporium. But, indeed, Levison's own annoyance was much too acute for him to notice any on the part of Hibbs. Well, he said, stopping dead in the middle of the shop, here is a fine, confounded kettle of fish. It is one of the tragedies of the diplomatic that they are not allowed to admit either knowledge or ignorance. So Hibbs looked gloomily wise, and said, pursing his lips, You mean the general situation? I mean the situation about this everlasting business of the inn sign, said Levison impatiently. Lord Ivywood went up specially, when his leg was really bad, to get it settled in the house in a small non-contentious bill, providing that the sign shouldn't be enough if the liquor hadn't been on the spot three days. Oh, but said Hibbs, sinking his voice to a soft solemnity, as being one of the initiate, a thing like that can be managed, don't you know? Of course it can, said the other, still with the same slightly irritable air. It was. But it doesn't seem to occur to you, any more than it did to his lordship, that there is rather a weak point, after all, in this business of passing acts quietly because they're unpopular. Has it ever occurred to you that if a law is really kept too quiet to be opposed, it may also be kept too quiet to be obeyed? It's not so easy to hush it up from a big politician without running the risk of hushing it up even from a common policeman. But surely that can't happen by the nature of things. Can't it, by God, said J. Levison, appealing to a less pantheistic authority. He unfolded a number of papers from his pocket chiefly cheap local papers, but some of them letters and telegrams. Listen to this, he said. A curious incident occurred in the village of Boltwell in Surrey yesterday morning. The baker's shop of Mr. Whiteman was suddenly besieged by a knot of the looser types of the locality, who appear to have demanded beer instead of bread, basing their claim on some ornamental object erected outside the shop, which object they asserted to be a signboard within the meaning of the act. There, you see, they haven't even heard of the new act. What do you think of this from the Clapton Conservator? The contempt of socialists for the law was well illustrated yesterday, when a crowd collected round some wooden ensign of socialism set up before Mr. Dugdale's drapery stores refused to disperse, though told that their action was contrary to the law. Eventually the malcontents joined the procession following the wooden emblem. And what do you say to this? Stop press news. A chemist in Pimlico has been invaded by a huge crowd demanding beer, and asserting the provision of it to be among his duties. The chemist is, of course, well acquainted with his immunities in the matter, especially under the new act. 
but the old notion of the importance of the sign seems still to possess the populace, and even to a certain extent to paralyze the police. What do you say to that? Isn't it as plain as Monday morning that this flying in has flown a day in front of us, as all such lies do? There was a diplomatic silence. Well, asked the still angry Levison, of the still dubious Hibbs, what do you make of all that? One ill acquainted with that relativity, essential to all modern minds, might possibly have fancied that Mr. Hibbs could not make much of it. However that may be, his explanations, or incapacity for explanations, were soon tested with a fairly positive test, for Lord Ivywood actually walked into the shop of Mr. Crook. "'Good day, gentlemen,' he said, looking at them with an expression which they both thought baffling, and even a little disconcerting. "'Good morning, Mr. Crook. I have a celebrated visitor for you.' And he introduced the smiling Misistra. The prophet had fallen back on a comparatively quiet costume this morning, a mere matter of purple and orange, or what not, but his aged face was now perennially festive. "'The cause progresses,' he said. "'Everywhere the cause progresses. You heard his lordship's beautiful speech?' "'I have heard many,' said Hibbs, gracefully, that can be so described. "'The prophet means what I was saying about the Ballot Paper Amendment Act,' said Ivywood, casually. It seems to be the alphabet of statesmanship to recognize now that the great Oriental British Empire has become one corporate whole with the Occidental one. Look at our universities with their Mohammedan students. Soon they may be a majority. Now are we, he went on, still more quietly, are we to rule this country under the forms of representative government? I do not pretend to believe in democracy, as you know, but I think it would be extremely unsettling and incalculable to destroy representative government. If we are to give Moslem Britain representative government, we must not make the mistake we made about the Hindus and military organization, which led to the mutiny. We must not ask them to make a cross on their ballot papers, for though it seems a small thing, it may offend them. So I brought in a little bill to make it optional between the old-fashioned cross and an upward curved mark that might stand for a crescent. And as it's rather easier to make, I believe it would be generally adopted. And so, said the radiant old Turk, the little light easily made curly mark is substituted for the hard, difficult, double-made cutting both ways mark. It is the more good for hygiene. For you must know, and indeed our good and wise chemist will tell you, that the Saracenic and the Arabian and the Turkish physicians were the first of all physicians, and taught all medicals to the barbarians of the Frankish territories, and many of the most modern and most fashionable remedies are thus of the Oriental origin. Yes, that is quite true, said Crook, in his rather cryptic and unsympathetic way. The powder called aranine lately popularized by Mr. Bowes, now Lord Helvellyn, who tried it first on birds, is made of plain desert sand, and what you see in prescriptions as cannabis indiensis is what our lively neighbors of Asia describe more energetically as bong. And so, in the same way, said Miss Isra, making soothing passes with his brown hand, like a mesmerist, in the same way the making of the crescent is hygienic. The making of the cross is non-hygienic. The crescent is a little wave, as a leaf, as a little curling feather, and he waved his hand with real artistic enthusiasm toward the capering curves of the new Turkish decoration which Ivywood had made fashionable in many of the fashionable shops. But when you make the cross, you must make one line so, and he swept the horizon with a brown hand, and then you must go back and make the other line so, and he made an upward gesture suggestive of one constrained to lift a pine tree, and then you'll become very ill. As a matter of fact, Mr. Crook, said Ivywood, in his polite manner, I brought the prophet here to consult you as the best authority on the very point you have just mentioned, the use of hashish or the hemp plant. I have it on my conscience to decide whether these oriental stimulants or sedatives shall come under the general veto we are attempting to impose on the vulgar intoxicants. 
Of course, one has heard of the horrible and voluptuous visions, and a kind of insanity attributed to the assassins and the old man of the mountain. But on the one hand, we must clearly discount much for the illimitable pro-Christian bias with which the history of these eastern tribes is told in this country. Would you say the effect of hashish was extremely bad? And he turned first to the prophet. You will see mosques, said that seer with candor, many mosques, more mosques, taller and taller mosques, till they reach the moon, and you hear a dreadful voice in the very high mosque calling the muezzin, and you will think it is Allah. Then you will see wives, many, many wives, more wives than you yet have. Then you will be rolled over and over in a great pink and purple sea, which is still wives. Then you will go to sleep. I have only done it once, he concluded mildly. And what do you think about hashish, Mr. Crook? asked Ivywood thoughtfully. I think it's hemp at both ends, said the chemist. I fear, said Lord Ivywood, I don't quite understand you. A hempen drink, a murder, and a hempen rope. That's my experience in India, said Mr. Crook. It is true, said Ivywood, yet more reflectively, that the thing is not Moslem in any sense of its origin. There is that against the assassins always. And, of course, he added, with a simplicity that had something noble about it, their connection with St. Louis discredits them rather. After a space of silence, he said suddenly, looking at Crook, So it isn't the sort of thing you chiefly sell? No, my lord, it isn't what I chiefly sell, said the chemist. He also looked steadily, and the wrinkles of his young old face were like hieroglyphics. The cause progress. Everywhere it progress, cried Miss Isra, spreading his arms and relieving a momentary tension of which he was totally unaware. The hygienic curve of the crescent will soon superimpose himself for your plus sign. You already use him for the short syllables in your dactyl, which is doubtless of oriental origin. You see the new game? He said this so suddenly that everyone turned round to see him produce from his purple clothing a brightly coloured and highly polished apparatus from one of the grand toy shops, which, on examination, seemed to consist of a kind of blue slate in a red and yellow frame, a number of divisions being already marked on the slate, about seventeen slate pencils with covers of different colours, and a vast number of printed instructions, stating that it was but recently introduced from the remote east and called knots and crescents. Strangely enough, Lord Ivywood, with all his enthusiasm, seemed almost annoyed at the emergence of this Asiatic discovery, more especially as he really wanted to look at Mr. Crook as hard as Mr. Crook was looking at him. Hibbs coughed considerately and said, Of course, all our things came from the east, and and he paused, being suddenly unable to remember anything but curry, to which he was very rightly attached. He then remembered Christianity, and mentioned that too. Everything from the East is good, of course, he ended, with an air of light omniscience. Those who in later ages and other fashions failed to understand how Misisra had ever got a mental hold on men like Lord Ivywood, left out two elements in the man, which are very attractive, especially to other men. One was that there was no subject on which the little Turk could not instantly produce a theory. The other was that, though the theories were crowded, they were consistent. He was never known to accept an illogical compliment. "'You are in error,' he said solemnly to Hibbs, "'because you say all things from the East are good. "'There is the East wind.' I do not like him, he is not good, and I think very much that all the warmth and all the wealthiness and the colours and the poems and the religiousness that the East was meant to give you have been much poisoned by this accident, this East wind. When you see the green flag of the prophet, you do not think of a green field in summer, you think of a green wave in your seas of winter, for you think it blown by the East wind. When you read of the moon-faced Huris, you think not of our moons like oranges, but of your moons like snowballs. Here a new voice contributed to the conversation. 
its contribution, though imperfectly understood, appeared to be, Naw, why should I wait for a little Jew in his dressing gown? Little Jews in their dressing gowns as their drinks, and we as our drinks. Bitter, miss. The speaker, who appeared to be a powerful person of the plastering occupation, looked round for the unmarried female he had ceremonially addressed and seemed honestly abashed that she was not present. Ivywood looked at the man with that expression of one turned to stone which his physique made so effective in him. But J. Levison, secretary, could summon no such powers of self-petrification. Upon his soul the slaughter red of that unhallowed eve arose when first the ship and he were foes, when he discovered that the poor are human beings, and therefore are polite and brutal within a comparatively short space of time. He saw that two other men were standing behind the plastering person, one of them apparently urging him to counsels of moderation, which was an ominous sign. And then he lifted his eyes and saw something worse than any omen. All the glass frontage of the shop was a cloud of crowding faces. They could not be clearly seen, since night was closing in on the street, and the dazzling fires of ruby and amethyst which the lighted shop gave to its great globes of liquid rather veiled than revealed them, but the foremost actually flattened and whitened their noses on the glass, and the most distant were nearer than Mr. Levison wanted them. Also he saw a shape erect outside the shop. The shape was of an upright staff and a square board. He could not see what was on the board. He did not need to see. Those who saw Lord Ivywood at such moments understood why he stood out so strongly in the history of his time, in spite of his frozen face and his fanciful dogmas. He had all the negative nobility that is possible to man. Unlike Nelson and most of the great heroes, he knew not fear. Thus he was never conquered by a surprise, but was cold and collected when other men had lost their heads, even if they had not lost their nerve. I will not conceal from you, gentlemen, said Lord Ivywood, that I have been expecting this. I will not even conceal from you that I have been occupying Mr. Crook's time until it occurred. So far from excluding the crowd, I suggest it would be an excellent thing if Mr. Crook could accommodate them all in his shop. I want to tell, as soon as possible, as large a crowd as possible, that the law is altered, and this folly about the flying in has ceased. Come in, all of you. Come in and listen. Thank you, said a man, connected in some way with motor buses, who lurched in behind the plasterer. Thank you, sir, said a bright little clockmender from Croydon, who immediately followed him. Thanks, said a rather bewildered clerk from Camberwell, who came next in the rather bewildered procession. Thank you, said Mr. Dorian Wimpole, who entered, carrying a large round cheese. Thank you, said Captain Dalroy, who entered carrying a large cask of rum. Thank you very much, said Mr. Humphrey Pump, who entered the shop carrying the sign of the old ship. I fear it must be recorded that the crowd which followed them dispensed with all expressions of gratitude, but though the crowd filled the shop so that there was no standing room to spare, Levison still lifted his gloomy eyes and beheld his gloomy omen, for though there were very many more people standing in the shop, there seemed to be no less people looking in at the window. Gentlemen, said Ivywood, all jokes come to an end. This one has gone so far as to be serious, and it might have become impossible to correct public opinion and expound to law-abiding citizens the true state of the law had I not been able to meet so representative an assembly in so central a place. It is not pertinent to my purpose to indicate what I think of the jest which Captain Dalroy and his friends have been playing upon you for the last few weeks, but I think Captain Dalroy will himself concede that I am not jesting. With all my heart, said Dalroy, in a manner that was unusually serious and even sad. Then he added with a sigh, And as you truly say, my jest has come to an end. That wooden sign, said Ivywood, pointing at the queer blue ship, can be cut up for firewood. It shall lead decent citizens a devil's dance no more. 
understand it once and for all before you learn it from policemen or prison warders you are under a new law that sign is the sign of nothing you can no more buy and sell alcohol by having that outside your house than if it were a lamp post do you mean to say governor said the plasterer with a dawn of intelligence on his large face which was almost awful to watch that i ain't to have a glass of bitter try a glass of rum said patrick captain dalroy said lord ivywood if you give one drop from that cask to that man you are breaking the law and you shall sleep in jail are you quite sure asked dalroy with a strange sort of anxiety i might escape i am quite sure said ivywood I have posted the police with full powers for the purpose, as you will find. I mean that this business shall end here to-night. If I find that policeman what told me I could have a drink just now, I'll knock his helmet into a fancy necktie, I will, said the plasterer. Why ain't people allowed to know the law? They ain't got no right to alter the law in the dark like that, said the clockmender. Damn the new law. What is the new law? asked the clerk. The words inserted by the recent act, said Lord Ivywood, with the cold courtesy of the conqueror, are to the effect that alcohol cannot be sold even under a lawful sign unless alcoholic liquors have been kept for three days on the premises. Captain Dalroy, that cask of yours has not, I think, been three days on these premises. I command you to seal it up and take it away. Surely, said Patrick, with an innocent air, the best remedy would be to wait till it has been three days on the premises. We might all get to know each other better. And he looked round at the ever-increasing multitude with hazy benevolence. You shall do nothing of the kind, said his lordship, with sudden fierceness. Well, answered Patrick, wearily, now I come to think of it, perhaps I won't. I'll have one drink here and go home to bed like a good little boy. "'And the constable shall arrest you,' thundered Ivywood. "'Why, nothing seems to suit you,' said the surprised Dalroy. "'Thank you, however, for explaining the new law so clearly. "'Unless alcoholic liquors have been three days on the premises, I shall remember it now. "'You always explain things so clearly. "'You only made one legal slip. "'The constables will not arrest me.' "'And why not?' demanded the nobleman, white with passion. Because, cried Patrick Dalroy, and his voice lifted itself like a lonely trumpet before the charge, because I shall not have broken the law, because alcoholic liquors have been three days on these premises, three months more likely, because this is a common grog shop, Philip Ivywood, because that man behind the counter lives by selling spirits to all the cowards and hypocrites who are rich enough to bribe a bad doctor. And he pointed suddenly at the small medicine glass on the counter by Hibbs and Levison. What is that man drinking? he demanded. Hibbs put out his hand hastily for his glass, but the indignant clockmender had snatched it first and drained it at a gulp. Scorch, he said and dashed the glass to atoms on the floor. "'Right you are, too,' roared the plasterer, seizing a big medicine bottle in each hand. "'We're going to have a little of the fun now, we are. What's in that big red bowl up there? I reckon it's port. Fetch it down, Bill.' Ivywood turned to Crook and said, scarcely moving his lips of marble, "'This is a lie.' "'It is the truth,' answered Crook, looking back at him with equal steadiness. Do you think you made the world that you should make it over again so easily? The world was made badly, said Philip, with a terrible note in his voice, and I will make it over again. Almost as he spoke, the glass front of the shop fell inward, shattered, and there was wreckage among the moonlight colored bowls, almost as if spheres of celestial crystal cracked at his blasphemy. Through the broken windows came the roar of that confused tongue that is more terrible than the elements, the cry that the deaf kings have heard at last, the terrible voice of mankind. All the way down the long fashionable street, lined with the crook plate glass, that glass was crashing amid the cries of a crowd. Rivers of gold and purple wines sprawled about the pavement. 
Out in the open, shouted Dalroy, rushing out of the shop, signboard in hand, the dog Quoodle barking furiously at his heels, while Dorian with the cheese and Humphrey with the keg followed as rapidly as they could. Good night, my lord. Perhaps our meeting next may fall at Tomworth in your castle hall. Come along, my friends, and form up. Don't waste time destroying property. We're all to start now. Where are we all going to? asked the plasterer. "'We're all going into Parliament,' answered the captain, as he went to the head of the crowd. The marching crowd turned two or three corners, and at the end of the next long street Dorian Wimpole, who was toward the tail of the procession, saw again the grey Cyclops Tower of St. Stephen's with its one great golden eye, as he had seen it against that pale green sunset that was once quiet and volcanic on the night he was betrayed by sleep and by a friend. Almost as far off, at the head of the procession, he could see the sign with the ship and the cross, going before them like an ensign, and hear a great voice singing, Men that are men again, who goes home? Toxin and trumpeter, who goes home? The voice of valedictory, who is for victory? Who is for liberty? Who goes home? End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of The Flying Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Thomas Copeland. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 23. The March on Ivywood. That storm spirit, or eagle of liberty, which is the sudden soul in a crowd, had descended upon London after a foreign tour of some centuries, in which it had commonly alighted upon other capitals. It is always impossible to define the instant and the turn of mood which makes the whole difference between danger being worse than endurance, and endurance being worse than danger. The actual outbreak generally has a symbolic or artistic or what some would call whimsical cause. Somebody fires off a pistol, or appears in an unpopular uniform, or refers in a loud voice to a scandal that is never mentioned in the newspapers. Somebody takes off his hat, or somebody doesn't take off his hat, and a city is sacked before midnight. When the ever-swelling army of revolt smashed a whole street full of the shops of Mr. Crook, the chemist, and then went on to Parliament, the Tower of London, and the road to the sea, the sociologists, hiding in their coal cellars, could think, in that clarifying darkness, of many material and spiritual explanations of such a storm in human souls, but of none that explained it quite enough. Doubtless there was a great deal of sheer drunkenness when the urns and goblets of Esculapius were reclaimed as belonging to Bacchus, and many who went roaring down that road were merely stored with rich wines and liqueurs which are more comfortably and quietly digested at a city banquet or a West End restaurant. But many of these had been blind drunk twenty times without a thought of rebellion. You could not stretch the material explanation to cover a corner of the case. Much more general was a savage sense of the meanness of Crook's wealthy patrons in keeping a door open for themselves which they had wantonly shut on less happy people. But no explanation can explain it, and no man can say when it will come. Dorian Wimpole was at the tail of the procession, which grew more and more crowded every moment. For one space of the march he even had the misfortune to lose it altogether. Owing to the startling activity which the rotund cheese, when it escaped from his hands, showed, in descending a somewhat steep road toward the river, but in recent days he had gained the pleasure in practical events which was like a second youth. He managed to find a stray taxicab, and had little difficulty in picking up again the trail of the extraordinary cortege. Inquiries addressed to a policeman with a black eye outside the House of Commons informed him sufficiently of the rebel's line of retreat, or advance, or whatever it was. And in a very short time he beheld the unmistakable legion once more, it was unmistakable, because in front of it there walked a red-headed giant, apparently carrying with him a wooden portion of some public building, and also because so big a crowd had never followed any man in England for a long time past. But except for such things, the unmistakable crowd might well have been mistaken for another one. 
Its aspect had been altered almost as much as if it had grown horns and tusks, for many of the company walked with outlandish weapons like iron teeth or horns, bills and pole-axes, and spears with strangely shaped heads. What was stranger still, whole rows and rows of them had rifles, and even marched with a certain discipline, and yet again others seemed to have snatched up household or workshop tools, meat-axes, pickaxes, hammers, and even carving-knives. Such things need be none the less deadly because they are domestic. They have figured in millions of private murders before they appeared in any public war. Dorian was so fortunate as to meet the flame-haired captain almost face to face, and easily fell into step with him at the head of the march. Humphrey Pump walked on the other side, with the celebrated cask suspended round his neck by something resembling braces, as if it were a drum. Mr. Wimpole had himself taken the opportunity of his brief estrangement to carry the cheese somewhat more easily in a very large, loose, waterproof knapsack on his shoulders. The effect in both cases was to suggest dreadful deformities in two persons who happened to be exceptionally cleanly built. The captain, who seemed to be in tearing and towering spirits, gained great pleasure from this. But Dorian had his sources of amusement, too. "'What have you been doing with yourselves since you lost my judicious guidance?' he asked, laughing. "'And why are parts of you a dull review, and parts of you a fancy-dress ball? What have you been up to?' "'We've been shopping,' said Mr. Patrick Dalroy, with some pride. "'We are country cousins. I know all about shopping. Let us see. What are the braces about it? Look at those rifles now. We got them quite at a bargain. We went to all the best gunsmiths in London, and we didn't pay much. In fact, we didn't pay anything. That's what is called a bargain, isn't it? Surely I've seen in those things they send to ladies something about giving them away. Then we went to a remnant sale. At least it was a remnant sale when we left. And we bought that piece of stuff we've tied round the sign. Surely it must be what ladies call chiffon? Dorian lifted his eyes and perceived that a very coarse strip of red rag, possibly collected from a dustbin, had been tied round the wooden signpost by way of a red flag of revolution. Not what ladies call chiffon? inquired the captain with anxiety. Well, anyhow, it is what chiffoniers call it. But as I'm going to call on a lady shortly, I'll try to remember the distinction. "'Is your shopping over, may I ask?' asked Mr. Wimpole. "'All but one thing,' answered the other. "'I must find a music shop. "'You know what I mean. "'Place where they sell pianos and things of that sort.' "'Look here,' said Dorian. "'This cheese is pretty heavy as it is. "'Have I got to carry a piano, too?' "'You must understand me,' said the captain calmly. "'And as he had never thought of music shops "'until his eye had caught one an instant before, "'he darted into the doorway.' Returning almost immediately with a long parcel under his arm, he resumed the conversation. "'Did you go anywhere else?' asked Dorian, except to shops. "'Anywhere else?' cried Patrick, indignantly. "'Haven't you got any country cousins? Of course we went to all the right places. We went to the Houses of Parliament. But Parliament isn't sitting, so there are no eggs of the quality suitable for elections. We went to the Tower of London. You can't tire country cousins like us.' We took away some curiosities of steel and iron. We even took away the halberds from the beef-eaters. We pointed out that for the purpose of eating beef, their only avowed public object, knives and forks had always been found more convenient. To tell the truth, they seemed rather relieved to be relieved of them. And may I ask, said the other with a smile, where you are off to now? Another beauty spot, cried the captain boisterously. No tiring the country cousin. I am going to show my young friends from the provinces what is perhaps the finest old country house in England. We are going to Ivywood, not far from that big watering place they call Pebblewick. I see, said Dorian, and for the first time looked back with intelligent trouble on his face on the marching ranks behind him. Captain Dalroy, said Dorian Wimple in a slightly altered tone, there is one thing that puzzles me. Ivywood talked about having set the police to catch us, and though this is a pretty big crowd, I simply cannot believe that the police, as I knew them in my youth, could not catch us. But where are the police? 
you seem to have marched through half London with much, if you'll excuse me, of the appearance of carrying murderous weapons. Lord Iverwood threatened that the police would stop us. Well, why didn't they stop us? Your subject, said Patrick cheerfully, divides itself into three heads. I hope not, said Dorian. There really are three reasons why the police should not be prominent in this business, as their worst enemy cannot say that they were. He began ticking off the three on his own huge fingers, and seemed to be quite serious about it. First, he said, you have been a long time away from town. Probably you do not know a policeman when you see him. They do not wear helmets, as our line regiments did after the Prussians had won. They wear fezes, because the Turks have won. Shortly, I have little doubt, they will wear pigtails, because the Chinese have won. It is a very interesting branch of moral science. It is called efficiency. Second, explained the captain, you have perhaps omitted to notice that a very considerable number of those wearing such fezes are walking just behind us. Oh, yes, it's quite true. Don't you remember that the whole French Revolution really began because a sort of city militia refused to fire on their own fathers and wives, and even showed some slight traces of a taste for firing on the other side? You'll see lots of them behind, and you can tell them by their revolver belts and their walking in step, but don't look back on them too much. It makes them nervous. And the third reason, asked Dorian. For the real reason, answered Patrick, I am not fighting a hopeless fight. People who have fought in real fights don't, as a rule. But I've noticed something singular about the very point you mention. Why are there no more police? Why are there no more soldiers? I will tell you. There really are very few policemen or soldiers left in England today. Surely that, said Wimpole, is an unusual complaint. But very clear, said the captain gravely, to anyone who has ever seen sailors or soldiers. I will tell you the truth. Our rulers have come to count on the bare bodily cowardice of a mass of Englishmen, as a sheepdog counts on the cowardice of a flock of sheep. Now look here, Mr. Wimpole, wouldn't a shepherd be wise to limit the number of his dogs if he could make his sheep pay by it? At the end... You might find millions of sheep managed by a solitary dog. But that is because they are sheep. Suppose the sheep were turned by a miracle into wolves. There are very few dogs they could not tear in pieces. But what is my practical point, there are really very few dogs to tear. You don't mean, said Dorian, that the British army is practically disbanded. There are the sentinels outside Whitehall, replied Patrick in a low voice. But, indeed, your question puts me in a difficulty. No, the army is not entirely disbanded, of course, but the British army. Did you ever hear, Wimpole, of the great destiny of the empire? I seem to have heard the phrase, replied his companion. It is in four acts, said Dalroy. Victory over barbarians, employment of barbarians, alliance with barbarians, conquest by barbarians. That is the great destiny of empire. I think I begin to see what you mean, returned Dorian Wimpole. Of course, Ivywood and the authorities do seem very prone to rely on the sepoy troops, and other troops as well, said Patrick. I think you will be surprised when you see them. He tramped on for a while in silence, and then said, with some air of abruptness, which yet did not seem to be entirely a changing of the subject, do you know the man who lives now on the estate next to Ivywood? No, replied Dorian. I am told he keeps himself very much to himself. And his estate, too, said Patrick, rather gloomily. If you would climb his garden wall, Wimpole, I think you would find an answer to a good many of your questions. Oh, yes, the right honourable gentlemen are making full provision for public order and national defence, in a way. He fell into an almost sullen silence again, and several villages had been passed before he spoke again. They tramped through the darkness, and dawn surprised them somewhere in the wilder and more wooded parts where the roads began to rise and roam. Dalroy gave an exclamation of pleasure and pointed ahead, drawing the attention of Dorian to the distance. Against the silver and scarlet bars of the daybreak, 
could be seen afar a dark purple dome with a crown of dark green leaves, the place they had called Roundabout. Dalroy's spirit seemed to revive at the sight, with the customary accompaniment of the threat of vocalism. "'Been making any poems lately?' he asked of Wimpole. "'Nothing particular,' replied the poet. "'Then,' said the captain, portentously clearing his throat, "'you shall listen to one of mine, whether you like it or not. "'Nay, the more you dislike it, the longer and longer it will be. "'I begin to understand why soldiers want to sing when on the march, "'and also why they put up with such rotten songs. "'The druids waved their golden knives "'and danced around the oak when they had sacrificed a man, "'but though the learned search and scan, "'no single modern person can entirely see the joke. But though they cut the throats of men, they cut not down the tree, and from the blood the sapling sprang of oak woods yet to be. But Ivywood, Lord Ivywood, he rots the tree as Ivywood, he clings and crawls as Ivywood about the sacred tree. King Charles, he fled from Worcester fight and hid him in an oak. In convent schools no man of tact would trace and praise his every act or argue that he was in fact a strict and sainted bloke. But not by him the sacred woods have lost their fancies free, and though he was extremely big, he did not break the tree. But Ivywood, Lord Ivywood, he breaks the tree as Ivywood, and eats the woods as Ivywood, between us and the sea. Great Collingwood walked down the glade and flung the acorns free, that oaks might still be in the grove as oaken as the beams above when the great lover sailor's love was kissed by death at sea. But though for him the oak trees fell to build the oaken ships, the woodman worshipped what he smote, and honoured even the chips. But Ivywood, Lord Ivywood, he hates the tree as Ivywood, as the dragon of the Ivywood that has us in his grips. They were ascending a sloping road, walled in on both sides by solemn woods, which somehow seemed as watchful as owls awake. Though daybreak, was going over them with banners, scrolls of scarlet and gold, and with a wind like trumpets of triumph, the dark woods seemed to hold their secret like dark, cool cellars, nor was the strong sunlight seen in them, save in one or two brilliant shafts that looked like splintered emeralds. I should not wonder, said Dorian, if the ivy does not find the tree knows a thing or two also. The tree does, assented the captain. The trouble was that until a little while ago the tree did not know that it knew. There was a silence, and as they went up, the incline grew steeper and steeper, and the tall trees seemed more and more to be guarding something from sight, as with the grey shields of giants. "'Do you remember this road, Hump?' asked Alroy of the innkeeper. "'Yes,' answered Humphrey Pump, and said no more. But few have ever heard such fullness in an affirmative. They marched on in silence, and about two hours afterward, toward eleven o'clock, Dalroy called a halt in the forest, and said that everybody had better have a few hours' sleep. The impenetrable quality in the woods, and the comparative softness of the carpet of beech mast, made the spot as appropriate as the time was inappropriate. And if anyone thinks that common people, casually picked up in a street, could not follow a random leader on such a journey, or sleep at his command in such a spot, given the state of the soul, then someone knows no history. "'I'm afraid,' said Dalroy, "'you'll have to have your supper for breakfast. I know an excellent place for having breakfast, but it's too exposed for sleep, and sleep you must have. So we won't unpack the stores just now. We'll lie down like babes in the wood, and any bird of an industrious disposition is free to start covering me with leaves.' Really, there are things coming before which you will want sleep. When they resumed the march, it was nearly the middle of the afternoon, and the meal which Dalroy insisted buoyantly on describing as breakfast was taken about that mysterious hour when ladies die without tea. The steep road had consistently grown steeper and steeper, and steeper, and at last Dalroy said to Dorian Wimpole, don't drop that cheese again just here, or it will roll right away down into the woods. I know it will. No scientific calculations of grades and angles are necessary, because I have seen it do so myself. In fact, I have run after it. 
Wimpole realized they were mounting to the sharp edge of a ridge, and in a few moments he knew, by the oddness of the shape of the trees, what it had been that the trees were hiding. They had been walking along a swelling woodland path beside the sea. On a particular high plateau projecting above the shore stood some dwarfed and crippled apple trees, of whose apples no man alive would have eaten, so sour and salt they must be. All the rest of the plateau was bald and featureless, but Pump looked at every inch of it as if at an inhabited place. This is where we'll have breakfast, he said, pointing to the naked grassy waste. It's the best inn in England. Some of his audience began to laugh, but somehow suddenly ceased doing so as Dalroy strode forward and planted the sign of the old ship on the desolate seashore. And now, he said, you have charge of the stores we brought home, and we will picnic. As it said in the song I once sang, The Saracen's head out of Araby came, King Richard riding in arms like flame, And where he established his folk to be fed, He set up his spear and the Saracen's head. It was nearly dusk before the mob, Much swelled by the many discontented on the Ivywood estates, Reached the gates of Ivywood House. Strategically, and for the purposes of a night surprise, this might have done credit to the captain's military capacity, but the use to which he put it actually was what some might call eccentric. When he had disposed his forces, with strict injunctions of silence for the first few minutes, he turned to Pump and said, And now, before we do anything else, I am going to make a noise. And he produced from under brown paper what appeared to be a musical instrument, a summons to parley, inquired Dorian, with interest. A trumpet of defiance, or something of that kind? No, said Patrick. A serenade. End of chapter 23。Section 24 of The Flying Inn。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Thomas Copeland. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 24. The Enigmas of Lady Joan. On an evening when the sky was clear and only its fringes embroidered with the purple arabesques of the sunset, Joan Brett was walking on the upper lawn of the terraced garden at Ivywood, where the peacocks trail themselves about. She was not unlike one of the peacocks herself in beauty, and some might have said in inutility. She had the proud head and the sweeping train, nor was she in these days devoid of the occasional disposition to scream. For, indeed, for some time past she had felt her existence closing round her with an incomprehensible quietude, and that is harder for the patience than an incomprehensible noise. Whenever she looked at the old yew hedges of the garden they seemed to be higher than when she saw them last as if those living walls could still grow to shut her in. Whenever from the turret windows she had a sight of the sea, it seemed to be farther away. Indeed, the whole closing of the end of the turret wing, with the new wall of eastern woodwork, seemed to symbolize all her shapeless sensations. In her childhood the wing had ended with a broken-down door and a disused staircase. They led to an uncultivated copse and an abandoned railway tunnel, to which neither she nor anyone else ever wanted to go. Still, she knew what they led to. Now it seemed that this scrap of land had been sold and added to the adjoining estate, and about the adjoining estate nobody seemed to know anything in particular. The sense of things closing in increased upon her. All sorts of silly little details magnified the sensation. She could discover nothing about this new landlord next door, so to speak, since he was, it seemed, an elderly man who preferred to live in the greatest privacy. Miss Browning, Lord Ivywood's secretary, could give her no further information than that he was a gentleman from the Mediterranean coast, which singular form of words seemed to have been put into her mouth. As a Mediterranean gentleman might mean anything from an American gentleman living in Venice to a black African on the edge of the Atlas, the description did not illuminate, and probably was not intended to do so. She occasionally saw his liveried servants going about, and their liveries were not like English liveries. She was also, 
in her somewhat morbid state, annoyed by the fact that the uniforms of the old Pebblewick militia had been changed under the influence of the Turkish prestige in the recent war. They wore fezes like the French Zouave, which were certainly much more practical than the heavy helmets they used to wear. It was a small matter, but it annoyed Lady Joan, who was, like so many clever women, at once subtle and conservative. It made her feel as if the whole world was being altered outside, and she was not allowed to know about it. But she had deeper spiritual troubles also. While under the pathetic entreaties of old Lady Ivywood and her own sick mother, she stayed on week after week at Ivywood House. If the matter be stated cynically, as she herself was quite capable of stating it, she was engaged in the established feminine occupation of trying to like a man. But the cynicism would have been false, as cynicism nearly always is, for during the most crucial days of that period she had really liked the man. She had liked him when he was brought in with Pump's bullet in his leg, and was still the strongest and calmest man in the room. She had liked him when the hurt took a dangerous turn, and when he bore pain to admiration. She had liked him when he showed no malice against the angry Dorian. She had liked him with something like enthusiasm on the night he rose rigid on his rude crutch, and crushing all remonstrance, made his rash and swift rush to London. But despite the queer closing-in sensations of which we have spoken, she never liked him better than that evening when he lifted himself laboriously on his crutch up to the terraces of the old garden, and came to speak to her as she stood among the peacocks. He even tried to pat a peacock in a hazy way, as if it were a dog. He told her that these beautiful birds were, of course, imported from the east, by the semi-eastern empire of Macedonia. But all the same, Joan had a dim suspicion that he had never noticed before that there were any peacocks at Ivywood. His greatest fault was a pride in the faultlessness of his mental and moral strength. But if he had only known, something faintly comic in the unconscious side of him did him more good with the woman than all the rest. They were said to be the birds of Juno, he said, but I have little doubt that Juno, like so much else of the Homeric mythology, has also an Asiatic origin. I always thought, said Joan, that Juno was rather too stately for the seraglio. You ought to know, replied Ivywood with a courteous gesture, for I never saw anyone who looked so like Juno as you do. But, indeed, there is a great deal of misunderstanding about the Arabian or Indian view of women. It is somehow too simple and solid for our paradoxical Christendom to comprehend. Even the vulgar joke against the Turks, that they like their brides fat, has in it a sort of distorted shadow of what I mean. They do not look so much at the individual as at womanhood and the power of nature. I sometimes think, said Joan, that these fascinating theories are a little strained. Your friend Miss Istra told me the other day that women had the highest freedom in Turkey, as they were allowed to wear trousers. Ivywood smiled his rare and dry smile. The prophet has something of a simplicity often found with genius, he answered. I will not deny that some of the arguments he has employed have seemed to me crude and even fanciful. But he is right at the root. There is a kind of freedom that consists in never rebelling against nature. And I think they understand it in the Orient better than we do in the West. You see, Joan, it is all very well to talk about love in our narrow, personal, romantic way. But there is something higher than the love of a lover, or the love of love. What is that? asked Joan, looking down. The love of fate said Lord Ivywood, with something like spiritual passion in his eyes. Doesn't Nietzsche say somewhere that the delight in destiny is the mark of the hero? We are mistaken if we think that the heroes and saints of Islam say kismet with bowed heads and in sorrow. They say kismet with a shout of joy. That which is fitting, that is what they really mean. In the Arabian tales, the most perfect prince is wedded to the most perfect princess, because it is fitting. The spiritual giants, the genii, achieve it, that is, the purposes of nature. In the selfish, sentimental European novels, the loveliest princess on earth might have run away with her middle-aged drawing-master. These things are not in the path. The Turk rides out to wed the fairest queen of the earth. He conquers empires to do it. 
and he is not ashamed of his laurels. The crumpled violet clouds around the edge of the silver evening looked to Lady Joan more and more like vivid violet embroideries hemming some silver curtain in the closed corridor at Ivywood. The peacocks looked more lustrous and beautiful than they ever had before. But for the first time she really felt they came out of the land of the Arabian Nights. Joan, said Philip Ivywood very softly in the twilight, I am not ashamed of my laurel. I see no meaning in what these Christians call humility. I will be the greatest man in the world if I can, and I think I can. Therefore something that is higher than love itself, fate and what is fitting, make it right that I should wed the most beautiful woman in the world, and she stands among the peacocks, and is more beautiful and more proud than they. Joan's troubled eyes were on the violet horizon and her troubled lips could utter nothing but something like, Don't. Joan, said Philip again, I have told you, you are the woman one of the great heroes could have desired. Let me now tell you something I could have told no one to whom I had not thus spoken of love and betrothal. When I was twenty years old in a town in Germany, pursuing my education, I did what the West calls falling in love. She was a fisher-girl from the coast, for this town was near the sea. My story might have ended there. I could not have entered diplomacy with such a wife, but I should not have minded then. But a little while after I wandered into the edges of Flanders, and found myself standing above some of the last grand reaches of the Rhine, and things came over me but for which I might be crying stinking fish to this day. I thought, how many holy or lovely nooks that river had left behind and gone on. It might anywhere in Switzerland have spent its weak youth in a spirit over a high crag, or anywhere in the Rhinelands lost itself in a marsh covered with flowers. But it went on to the perfect sea, which is the fulfillment of a river. Again Joan could not speak, and again it was Philip who went on. Here is yet another thing that could not be said till the hand of the prince had been offered to the princess. It may be that in the East they carry too far this matter of infant marriages. But look round on the mad young marriages that go to pieces everywhere, and ask yourself whether you don't wish they had been infant marriages. People talk in the newspapers of the heartlessness of royal marriages. But you and I do not believe the newspapers, I suppose. We know there is no king in England, nor has been since his head fell before Whitehall. You know that you and I and the families are the kings of England, and our marriages are royal marriages. Let the suburbs call them heartless. Let us say they need the brave heart that is the only badge of aristocracy. Joan, he said very gently, perhaps you have been near a crag in Switzerland, or a marsh covered with flowers. Perhaps you have known a fisher-girl? But there is something greater and simpler than all that, something you find in the great epics of the East, the beautiful woman and the great man and fate. My lord, said Joan, using the formal phrase by an unfathomable instinct, will you allow me a little more time to think of this? And let there be no notion of disloyalty if my decision is one way or the other. Why, of course, said Ivywood, bowing over his crutch, and he limped off, picking his way among the peacocks. For days afterward Joan tried to build the foundations of her earthly destiny. She was still quite young, but she felt as if she had lived thousands of years worrying over the same question. She told herself again and again, and truly, that many a better woman than she had taken a second best which was not so first class a second best. But there was something complicated in the very atmosphere. She liked listening to Philip Ivywood at his best, as anyone likes listening to a man who can really play the violin. But the great trouble always is that at certain awful moments you cannot be certain whether it is the violin or the man. Moreover, there was a curious tone and spirit in the Ivywood household 
especially after the wound and convalescence of Ivywood, about which he could say nothing except that it annoyed her somehow. There was something in it glorious, but also languorous. By an impulse by no means uncommon among intelligent, fashionable people, she felt a desire to talk to a sensible woman of the middle or lower classes, and almost threw herself on the bosom of Miss Browning for sympathy. But Miss Browning, with her curling reddish hair and white, very clever face, struck the same indescribable note. Lord Ivywood was assumed as a first principle, as if he were Father Time, or the clerk of the weather. He was called He. The fifth time he was called He, Joan could not understand why she seemed to smell the plants in the hot conservatory. "'You see,' said Miss Browning, "'we mustn't interfere with his career. That is the important thing. And really, I think the quieter we keep about everything, the better. I am sure he is maturing very big plans. You heard what the prophet said the other night? The last thing the prophet said to me, said the darker lady, in a dogged manner, was that when we English see the English youth, we cry out, He is crescent! But when we see the English aged man, we cry out, He is cross! A lady with so clever a face could not but laugh faintly, but she continued on a determined theme. The prophet said, you know, that all real love had in it an element of fate, and I am sure that is his view, too. People cluster round a centre, as little stars do round a star, because a star is a magnet. You are never wrong when destiny blows behind you like a great big wind, and I think many things have been judged unfairly that way. It's all very well to talk about the infant marriages in India. Miss Browning, said Joan, are you interested in the infant marriages in India? Well, said Miss Browning, is your sister interested in them? I'll run and ask her, cried Joan, plunging across the room to where Mrs. Mackintosh was sitting at a table scribbling secretarial notes. Well, said Mrs. Mackintosh, turning up a rich-haired, resolute head, more handsome than her sister's, I believe the Indian way is the best. When people are left to themselves in early youth, any of them might marry anything. We might have married a nigger or a fishwife or a, a criminal. Now, Mrs. Mackintosh, said Joan, with black-browed severity, you well know you would never have married a fishwife. Where is Enid? she ended suddenly. Lady Enid, said Miss Browning, is looking out music in the music room, I think. Joan walked swiftly through several long salons and found her fair-haired and pallid relative actually at the piano. Enid! cried Joan. You know I've always been fond of you. For God's sake, tell me, what is the matter with this house? I admire Philip as everybody does, but what is the matter with the house? Why do all these rooms and gardens seem to be shutting me in and in and in? Why does everything look more and more the same? Why does everybody say the same thing? Oh, I don't often talk metaphysics, but there is a purpose in this. That's the only way of putting it. There is a purpose, and I don't know what it is. Lady Enid Wimpole played a preliminary bar or two on the piano. Then she said, Nor do I, Joan. I don't, indeed. I know exactly what you mean. But it's just because there is a purpose that I have faith in him and trust him. She began softly to play a ballad tune of the Rhineland, and perhaps the music suggested her next remark. Suppose you were looking at some of the last reaches of the Rhine, where it flows... Enid, cried Joan, if you say into the North Sea, I shall scream. Scream, do you hear, louder than all the peacocks together. Well, expostulated Lady Enid, looking up rather wildly, the Rhine does flow into the North Sea, doesn't it? I dare say, said Joan recklessly, but the Rhine might have flowed into the round pond before you would have known or cared until... "'Until what?' asked Enid, and her music suddenly ceased. "'Until something happened that I cannot understand,' said Joan, moving away. "'You are something I cannot understand,' said Enid Wimpole. "'But I will play something else if this annoys you.' And she fingered the music again with an eye to choice. Joan walked back through the corridor of the music room, and restlessly resumed her seat in the room with the two lady secretaries. Well, asked the red-haired and good-humoured Mrs. Mackintosh, without looking up from her work of scribbling, have you discovered anything? 
For some moments Joan appeared to be in a blacker state of brooding than usual. Then she said in a candid and friendly tone, which somehow contrasted with her knit and swarthy brows, No, really. At least I think I've only found out two things, and they are only things about myself. I've discovered that I do like heroism, but I don't like hero worship. Surely, said Miss Browning, in the Girton manner, the one always flows from the other. I hope not, said Joan. But what else can you do with the hero? asked Mrs. Mackintosh, still without looking up from her writing, except worship him. You might crucify him, said Joan, with a sudden return of savage restlessness as she rose from her chair. Things seemed to happen then. Aren't you tired? asked the Miss Browning, who had the clever face. Yes, said Joan, and the worst sort of tiredness, when you don't even know what you're tired of. To tell the honest truth, I think I'm tired of this house. It's very old, of course, and parts of it are still dismal, said Miss Browning, but he has enormously improved it. The decoration with the moon and stars down in the wing with the turret is really... Away in the distant music-room, Lady Enid, having found the music she preferred, was fingering its prelude on the piano. At the first few notes of it, Joan Brett stood up like a tigress. Thanks, she said with a hoarse softness. That's it, of course. And that's just what we all are. She's found the right tune now. What tune is it? asked the wondering secretary. The tune of harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, said Joan, softly and fiercely, when we shall bow down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Girls, women, do you know what this place is? Do you know why it is all doors within doors, and lattice behind lattice, and everything is curtained and cushioned, and why the flowers that are so fragrant here are not the flowers of our hills? From the distant and slowly darkening music-room, Enid Wimpole's song came thin and clear. Less than the dust beneath thy chariot wheel, less than the rust that never stained thy sword. Do you know what we are? demanded Joan Brett again. We are a harem. Why, what can you mean? cried the younger girl in great agitation. Why, Lord Ivywood has never. I know he has never. I am not sure, said Joan, even whether he would ever. I shall never understand that man, nor will anybody else. But I tell you, that is the spirit. That is what we are. And this room stinks of polygamy, as certainly as it smells of tube roses. Why, Joan, cried Lady Enid, entering the room like a well-bred ghost. What on earth is the matter with you? You all look as white as sheets. Joan took no heed of her, but went on with her own obstinate argument. And besides, she said, if there is one thing we do know about him, it is that he believes on principle in doing things slowly. He calls it evolution and relativity and the expanding of an idea into larger ideas. How do we know he isn't doing that slowly, getting us accustomed to living like this so that it may be the less shock when he goes further? steeping us in the atmosphere before he actually introduces, and she shuddered, the institution. Is it any more calmly outrageous a scheme than any other of Ivywood's schemes, than a sepoy commander-in-chief, or a misistra preaching in Westminster Abbey, or the destruction of all the inns in England? I will not wait and expand. I will not be evolved. I will not develop into something that is not me. My feet shall be outside these walls, if I walk the roads for it afterward. Or I will scream as I would scream trapped in any den at the docks. She swept down the rooms toward the turret, with a sudden passion for solitude. But as she passed the astronomical wood-carving that had closed up the end of the old wing, Enid saw her strike it with her clinched hand. It was in the turret that she had a strange experience. She was again, later on, using its isolation to worry out the best way of having it out with Philip when he should return from his visit to London, for to tell old Lady Ivywood what was on her mind would be about as kind, and as useful, as describing Chinese tortures to a baby. The evening was very quiet, of the pale grey sort, and all that side of Ivywood lay before her eyes undisturbed. 
she was the more surprised when her dreaming took note of a sort of stirring in the grey-purple dusk of the bushes, of whisperings, and of many footsteps. Then the silence settled down again, and then it was startlingly broken by a big voice singing in the dark distance. It was accompanied by faint sounds that might have been from the fingering of some lute or viol. Lady, the light is dying in the skies. Lady, and let us die when honor dies. Your dear dropped glove was like a gauntlet flung when you and I were young. For something more than splendor stood, and ease was not the only good about the woods in ivy wood when you and I were young. Lady, the stars are falling pale and small. Lady, we will not live if life be all. Forgetting those good stars in heaven hung when all the world was young. For more than gold was in a ring and love was not a little thing between the trees in ivy wood when all the world was young. The singing ceased, and the bustle in the bushes could hardly be called more than a whisper. But sounds of the same sort and somewhat louder seemed wafted round corners from other sides of the house, and the whole night seemed full of something that was alive, but was more than a single man. She heard a cry behind her, and Enid rushed into the room as white as one of the lilies. "'What awful thing is happening?' she cried. "'The courtyard is full of men shouting, and there are torches everywhere.' And Joan heard a tramp of men marching, and heard afar off another song, sung on a more derisive note, something like, "'But ivy wood, Lord ivy wood, he rots the tree as ivy wood.' "'I think,' said Joan thoughtfully, "'it is the end of the world.' "'But where are the police?' wailed her cousin. "'They don't seem to be anywhere about since they wore those fezzes.' We shall be murdered, or three thundering and measured blows shook the decorative wood panelling at the end of the wing, as if admittance were demanded with the club of a giant. Enid remembered that she had thought Joan's little blow energetic, and shuddered. Both the girls stared at the stars and moons and suns blazoned on that sacred wall that leapt and shuddered under the strokes of the doom. Then the sun fell from heaven, and the moon and stars dropped down and were scattered about the Persian carpet and by the opening of the end of the world, Patrick Dalroy came in, carrying a mandolin. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 of The Flying Inn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Shrimp Fish. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. The Finding of the Superman. I've brought you a little dog, said Mr. Dalroy, introducing the rampant Quoodle. I had him brought down here in a large hamper labeled Explosives, a title which appears to have been well selected. He had bowed to Lady Enid on entering, and taken Joan's hand with the least suggestion that he wanted to do something else with it, but he resolutely resumed his conversation, which was on the subject of dogs. "'People who bring back dogs,' he said, "'are always under a cloud of suspicion. Sometimes it is hideously hinted that the citizen who brings the dog back with him is identical with the citizen who took the dog away with him.' In my case, of course, such conduct is inconceivable. But the returners of dogs, that prosperous and increasing class, are also accused, he went on, looking straight at Joan, with blank blue eyes, of coming back for a reward. There is more truth in this charge. Then, with a change of manner more extraordinary than any revolution, even the revolution that was roaring round the house, he took her hand again and kissed it, saying with a confounding seriousness, I know at least that you will pray for my soul. You had better pray for mine, if I have one, answered Joan. But why now? Because, said Patrick, you will hear from outside. 
you may even see from that turret window something which in brute fact has never been seen in england since poor monmouth's army went down in spirit and in truth it has not happened since saladin and cure de leon crashed together i only add one thing and that you know already i have lived loving you and i shall die loving you it is the only dimension of the universe in which i have not wandered and gone astray i leave the dog to guard you and he disappeared down the old broken staircase lady enid was much mystified that no popular pursuit assailed the stair or invaded this house but lady joan knew better she had gone on the suggestion she most cared about into the turret room and looked out of its many windows on to the abandoned copse and tunnel which were now fenced off with high walls the boundary of the mysterious property next door across that high barrier she could not even see the tunnel and barely the tops of the tallest trees which hid its entrance from sight but in an instant she knew that dalroy was not hurling his forces on ivywood at all but on the house and estate beyond it and then followed a sight that was not an experience but rather a revolving vision she could never describe it afterward nor could any of those involved in so violent and mystical a wheel she had seen a huge wall of a breaker wash all over the parade at pebblewick and wondered that so huge a hammer could be made merely of water she had never had a notion of what it is like when it is made of men the palisade built up by the new landlord in front of the old tangled ground by the tunnel she had long regarded as something as settled and ordinary as one of the walls of the drawing-room it swung and split and sprang into a thousand pieces under the mere blow of human bodies bursting with rage and the great wave crested the obstacle more clearly than she had ever seen any great wave crest the parade only when the fence was broken she saw behind it something that robbed her of reason so that she seemed to be living in all ages and all lands at once she never could describe the vision afterward but she always denied it was a dream she said it was worse it was something more real than reality it was a line of real soldiers which is always a magnificent sight but they might have been the soldiers of hannibal or of attila they might have been dug up from the cemeteries of sidon and babylon for all joan had to do with them there encamped in english meadows with a hawthorn tree in front of them and three beeches behind was something that has never been in camp nearer than some leagues south of paris since that careless called the hammer broke it backward at tours there flew the green standard of that great faith and strong civilization which has so often almost entered the great cities of the west which long encircled vienna which was barely barred from paris but which had never before been seen in arms on the soil of england at one end of the line stood philip ivywood in a uniform of his own special creation a compromise between the sepoy and the turkish uniform the compromise worked more and more wildly in joan's mind if any impression remained it was merely that england had conquered india and turkey had conquered england then she saw that ivywood for all his uniform was not the commander of these forces for an old man with a great scar on his face which was not a european face set himself in the front of the battle as if it had been a battle in the old epics and crossed swords with patrick dalroy he had come to return the scar upon his forehead and he returned it with many wounds though at last it was he who sank under the sword thrust he fell on his face and dalroy looked at him with something that is much more great than pity blood was flowing from patrick's wrist and forehead but he made a salute with his sword as he was doing so the corpse as it appeared laboriously lifted a face with feeble eyelids and seeming to understand the quarters of the sky by instinct oman pasha dragged himself a foot or so to the left and fell with his face toward mecca after that the turret turned round and round about joan and she knew not whether the things she saw were history or prophecy something in that last fact of being crushed by the weapons of brown men and yellow secretly entrenched in english meadows had made the english what they had not been for centuries the hawthorn tree was twisted and broken as it was at the battle of ashdown when alfred led his first charge against the danes the beech trees were splashed up to their lowest branches with the minglings of brave heathen and brave christian blood 
she knew no more than that when a column of the christian rebels read by humphrey at the sign of the ship burst through the choked and forgotten tunnel and took the turkish regiment in the rear it was the end that violent and revolving vision became something beyond the human voice or human ear she could not intelligently hear even the shots and shouts round the last magnificent rally of the turks it was natural therefore that she should not hear the words lord ivywood addressed to his next-door neighbour a turkish officer or rather to himself but his words were i have gone where god has never dared to go i am above the silly supermen as they are above mere men where i walk in the heavens no man has walked before me and i am alone in a garden all this passing about me is like the lonely plucking of garden flowers i will have this blossom i will have that the sentence ended so suddenly that the officer looked at him as if expecting him to speak but he did not speak but patrick and joan wandering together in a world made warm and fresh again as it can be for few in a world that caused courage frenzy and love superstition feeling every branching tree as a friend with arms open for the man or every sweeping slope as a great train trailing behind the woman did one day climb up to the little white cottage that was now the home of the superman he sat playing with a pale reposeful face with scraps of flour and weed put before him on a wooden table he did not notice them nor anything else around him scarcely even enid wimpole who attended to all his wants he is perfectly happy she said quietly joan with the glow on her dark face could not prevent herself from replying and we are so happy yes said enid but his happiness will last and she wept i understand said joan and kissed her cousin not without tears of her own end of the flying in by g k chesterton